Making a comic cover seems like an easy task. For an artist, creating a cover is much less work compared to translating a writer's script accurately and stylishly onto a 22-page comic every single month, which is the weighty task that every interior comic artist has to carry and deliver on. Doing a comic book cover gives artists the chance to be perfect and precise, to glamorously show off their full potential on center stage. There is some great cover art out there, and it's a wonderful feeling to collect a series of creative comic book covers that match in style and tone. Creating covers is not as easy as it looks though, especially when you realize that they are responsible for a lot of people's first impressions. At best, comic book covers can spark intrigue, curiosity, and interest in customers, not just at the cover itself, but toward the story that lies within. At worst, comic covers can turn customers off through unappealing art, weird gimmicks, and offensive, controversial content. So let's finally talk about it. Let's discuss a few of comic book's most controversial covers, starting with one variant cover that sparked heavy debate around a decade ago. In 2014, the Spider-Woman comic got relaunched for the fifth time. Written by Dennis Hopeless Hallam with art by Greg Land and Javier Rodriguez, this series lasted for a mere 10 issues. And unfortunately, what people remember most from this comic isn't the story, but a notoriously controversial variant cover it had for its first issue. This variant cover, drawn by Milo Manara, drew more attention than Marvel would have wanted. If you don't know, Milo Minara is an Italian comic book artist known for his erotic art. I've actually seen his most famous work, uh, Gullivera, which is an erotic parody of Gulliver's Travels in a comic book store here and are shocked because I live in Asia. Anyway, Marvel hired him to do this cover and it caused a huge ruckus. A ton of people bashed Marvel for doing this because they were trying to appeal to a more female demographic during this time. And when you're trying to depict your female characters as interesting and complex human beings rather than sexual objects, you should not hire Milo Minard to do a cover for your female superhero comic. But the thing is, I kind of also get the other side of the argument here. There was a group of people who believed this was totally fine because this wasn't even the main cover anyway. Plus, a significant amount of people thought that the cover wasn't very sexualized compared to a lot of other comic book covers out there. And that's true. There's a lot of comic book covers that depict women in a more sexual manner than this. This cover isn't really a significant thing though in my opinion. And it's unfortunate that the conversation around this cover continues to overshadow the discussion of the actual comic book it advertised until today. My opinion doesn't carry that much weight since I'm not a girl, but if I had to give my opinion, I don't think Marvel should have made this move, but I'm not really irritated or angered by this cover, especially because they never made one like this again after the backlash. I'm actually pretty biased though because uh, I have witnessed so much worse. Heroes for Hire issue 13, published on September 12 of 2007, had this for a main cover. This was not a variant or optional cover for the comic. What you're seeing here is the main cover of the comic that everyone who bought it had to pick up. Drawn by Sana Takeda, a Japanese illustrator who later won several awards illustrating on the beautiful monstrous book which I enjoy, the cover for Heroes for Hire 13 is problematic for reasons I don't think I need to spell out. The cover depicts Black Cat, Misty Knight, and Colleen Wing dangling on a rope with huge cleavages as well as tentacles surrounding them to do god knows what to them. 
It's kind of hilarious to me that this exists. I have no idea how this was able to pass as a main cover, especially since this is so much more explicit and sexual than Milo Minara's Spider Woman cover. I think the fact that this main cover for Heroes for Hired issue 13 was given a pass while seven years later, a less sexual variant cover became the center of controversy says something about the comic book fandom. In the short span of seven years, we became much more progressive about how we depicted women in comics. What used to be uncontroversial and normal in the 90s and early 2000s has become quite offensive and outdated. Since we're on the topic of history and how different we viewed things in the past, let's visit the distant time that was the year 1950. A controversial comic cover from that time, Crime Suspense Stories issue 22, is regarded as one of the most iconic covers in the history of American comics. It was famously the center of attention in the Senate hearing committee to judge whether or not comic books were tied to juvenile delinquency, an idea that was heavily pushed by Dr. Frederick Wortham through his book Seduction of the Innocent. As we all know, heavy censorship would arrive in the comic book industry a few years later, and EC Comics, the thriving publishing company behind this infamous cover, would run out of business due to heavy censorship being implemented in the comic book industry. Fortunately for the CEO though, he'd have an even more successful career in the magazine industry. But back to the cover in question, I think it makes sense why this was controversial. I still think it looks gruesome and violent, especially for a younger audience. The image of a man carrying a bloody axe on his right hand while holding a woman's chopped head in the other is still edgier than most comic book covers today. But I doubt the comic would garner much controversy if it were to be published in this day and age. If it were to be released next month or so, the comic cover would have a teenage or mature rating and no one would bat an eye. What's so interesting about violence in comics and other media is that it's had the opposite journey compared to female sexualization in media over the years. Nowadays, we're more sensitive and caring in the way we portray women, which is nice, but when it comes to violence, we become more desensitized to it. Maybe it's video games, early YouTube videos, or shonen anime becoming more globally mainstream, but people's tolerance for violence is much higher than it was before. Most kids I know today are into things like Demon Slayer, Jujutsu Kaisen, Call of Duty, and etc. Sure, most people will still probably find the cover of Crime Suspense Stories 22 to be violent, but it doesn't alarm people the way it used to. This cover is interesting because it shows how once controversial things can lose shock value over time. Speaking of shock value and violence, let's talk about a modern variant cover that was retracted because of fan outrage. Batgirl issue 41 published in June of 2015 was going to have this variant cover drawn by Raphael Albuquerque. And if you know anything about Batgirl, I'm pretty sure you don't like what this represents. The cover of Joker holding Batgirl hostage is an ode to 1988's The Killing Joke by Alan Moore and Brian Boland, one of the most iconic Batman comics of all time. But it's also a comic that contains Batgirl's worst moment. In the graphic novel, Joker shoots Barbara Gordon, strips her nude, takes photos of her, kidnaps her dad, and more than I will not say. The Killing Joke is one of the darkest stories in Batman history, one I don't recommend for the faint of heart. Barbara Gordon's treatment in this story is something that Alan Moore regrets doing. In The Killing Joke, Barbara is just used as a plot device, a catalyst for Jim Gordon to almost lose his mind and for Batman to have a sense of urgency and rage against the Joker. But without the infamous incident, the comic would not have been that powerful in my opinion. 
Still, I don't know why this variant cover was set to be printed. If it was for a Joker title, it'd be more fitting, but this is a Batgirl variant cover referencing her worst and weakest moment in a comic that used her as a plot device. Similar to Heroes for Higher Issue 13, there is not much of a middle ground to this in my opinion. This just shouldn't exist as a Batgirl cover. And after fan backlash to the announcement, Raphael Abakirki sensibly told DC to retract it from being published. It's quite rare for a cover to have so much backlash that it gets retracted, but this isn't the only time that's happened. The supposed cover for Ecstatics issue 15 by the amazing Mike Allred, who is the artist behind my favorite Silver Surfer comic run, caught a ton of fire for having Princess Diana on the cover six years after she tragically died in a car crash. What was weird about the issue is that the creators intended to have the late Princess Diana join this quirky new rendition of the X-Force, and the name of the story arc this issue was part of was called Back from the Dead. Due to backlash, Peter Milligan and Mike Allred replaced her with a character of their own, a fictional pop star named Henrietta Hunter. This controversy is one of the weirdest things ever because it's just so specific, but it makes some sense. Ecstatics is a quirky, cynical, satirical superhero team who are a bunch of celebrities trying to sell out. Having read a good chunk of this bonker series, I definitely see why the creators of Ecstatics wanted to put Princess Diana in their comic about a celebrity superhero team in the cultural spotlight. I was not born during this time though and am not familiar with the importance of the royal family, so I don't really know if I even have a say on this one, but it's definitely an interesting controversy to talk about. This isn't the only weird comic controversy though, because one happened quite recently. In June of 2022, DC released some previews for some covers to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, which were set to release later that year. They featured characters like Kyle Rayner, Jessica Cruz, Blue Beetle, and Hawk Girl. I honestly think they're well illustrated and nice, but do you notice something weird? All of the covers featured the characters eating, serving, or holding Mexican food. People said that these covers reduced Mexican culture to just food when there's so much more aspects to Mexican culture out there. Things got even worse when the artist for the Kyle Rayner cover, George Molina, came out and announced something really weird about it. Initially, he intended for the Kyle Rayner cover to be a tribute to this painting by George Gonzalez Camarena, but due to legal issues, the preview cover shown by DC saw Kyle Rayner holding a bag of tamales instead. When people found about this news though, they complained, and somehow, this story had a fortunate ending. On August 31 of 2022, George Molina announced that his initial cover was going to be the official one, and that the other version people complained about was just an alternate version DC accidentally put out. There's a final controversial comic book cover that I want to talk about. It's one of the most iconic comic book covers of all time. One I don't think anyone will find controversial at all. We've seen earlier how inoffensive covers can become controversial over time, and how once controversial covers can feel typical in the current age. But have you ever witnessed a comic book cover once viewed as incredibly problematic turn into a bold, celebrated piece of art? Well, that's what happened with the now iconic cover of Captain America's debut issue. The cover depicts the fresh new war hero striking a blow against the Nazi regime by punching Hitler across the face. While it might not seem like a very bold cover, writer Joe Simon, artist Jack Kirby, and editor-in-chief Martin Goodman risked a lot having Captain America fight Hitler himself in his first outing. 
the three of them were Jewish. Actually, most comic book creators were. But this cover was especially surprising and risky because this was released on March 1 of 1941, before Pearl Harbor and America's engagement in the war. The drama around the cover when it came out was fierce as fire, with Joe Simon even getting physical threats for what Timely Comics had published. But ultimately, this bold risk paid off big time. Captain America issue 1 sold like pancakes, and a huge factor of its success was the flashy, enticing, and brave political cover. Not only is it a wonderful and iconic piece of art, but it stands as a symbol of courage and valor against oppressive regimes. And I think this cover is a good one to end this video on because it shows just how important and significant this seemingly minor aspect of comics can be. Publishers focus a lot of their attention on creating well-made covers to entice readers to purchase their comics. But as we've learned today, there's so much more than that. Because covers are people's first impression of a comic and are generally supposed to have socially acceptable qualities since they are displayed in front of the public audience, it makes controversial comic covers all the more triggering and polarizing. But from examining the outrage, we can deduce history and cultural shifts. Through reacting to controversial art, we can discover more about the world and ourselves. I first decided to make this video because I thought it would be an easy and funny one to make. But alas, even though I did chuckle at some insane covers, I'm leaving this video more unsure than when I began. Of course, there are some comic book covers that I have definitive takes on. I have no problem with a cover of Astonishing X-Men issue 51, and I'm definitely against the way black and Asian people are depicted in the covers of Captain America issue 23 and Action Comics issue 58. But a lot of these controversial covers are more complex than that, bringing up subjects that I'm not really very sure of or are well versed in. But I don't regret talking about this stuff whatsoever. Even if this video was overly long and some of these covers were difficult to look at, I think I gained a lot. Seeing past and present controversy is not only an avenue to talk and think about important societal issues, but it also makes us appreciate and admire just how far we've come, even though we still have a long way to go. My name is Joshua C, and I will see you in the next comic book video.